there's a mouse in my house and I'm gonna slap paint all over it. All right, let's check out what I've done on this model. So to start with, I added copper tubing and some aluminum tubing for the barrels. And here I just upgraded the look of the headlamps. And then I added in the channel areas here. And added the tubing for the lights. On the bottom here I added this bracket. I'm not sure what it does other than stabilize these guns and keep them together. Here on the bottom I added some Archer wet transfer raised panel lines. And then over the build I went in and emphasized some of the weld beads and the flame cut marks on the sides and drilled out where tow cables would go and on the back here I added support for removing the uh, spent casings and on the sides here of the tracks I just emphasized where the pins would be I drilled out the exhausts and added some weld bead detail around these splash guards and that pretty much is all the detail that I added Okay, the first thing I'm going to do before I get into any painting is clean the model with some alcohol. That'll be good for cleaning, so let's go on to the paint process next. Hello my friends, welcome back. In today's video we'll be building this 1-100 scale teeny tiny mouse by Vesta Model. Well, there's a good example of what not to do when heating plastic sprue. If you're interested in 80s vintage movies, stick around to the very end because there may or may not be some hot footage. With this technique, just remember that filters are a filter, they're not a wash. So as you can see, I remove most of the filter off on a towel and the rest I apply to the model as almost like a glaze, I suppose you could call it. You're just trying to tone the paint. You don't want to leave deposits of thinner or uh, pigment anywhere on the model. You can also see here I'm not using the filter straight out of the bottle. I do like to thin it a bit. I just find most of them a little too strong straight out of the bottle. You can really see here how the filter blends these colors together a little more and adds just a little more warmth to the color. It also helps unify the three camouflage colors together and makes it look less toy-like.
I always place my oils on a piece of cardboard or a card stock before I put them on my palette. This removes the linseed oil and helps your paint retain more of a matte finish. As you can see, I'm using a toothpick to apply the dot filter. You can use a brush if you want, uh, it doesn't really matter. All you're concerned about is getting roughly the same size dots. The key here is just to keep things random. This technique also helps unify the colors together and gives the surface more of a weathered appearance. To some of you this might look shockingly bad, but in a second or two you'll see how blending all these colors together really unifies the camo and helps alter or shift these colors even further. Using a soft wide brush will help eliminate some of the streaking that was caused from the dot filter. You can really see the way the color shifts in this example. Repeat this process for the rest of the model. This will also help make the surface look like it was all weathered at the same time. On horizontal surfaces, use a poking twisting motion. When most of the paint is blended out, clean your brush off and take a little thinner and clean up the remaining residue and blend things out just a little more. Use the same process for the turret. Once you've completed the uh, pre-moistening on the surface of your model, you probably want to give it about five or six minutes just to dry out a little bit before you get to the pin wash. Five minutes later. By adding thinner to the model, this helps break the surface tension, and that's where capillary action comes in, helping the wash get into all those panel lines and surface details. The mouse was a late war combat vehicle and as far as we know it wasn't used in service at all. It may have been at some point but there's no documented records of the tank being used at all so I wanted to keep it fairly chip free. Of course I wanted to add the weathering and that kind of thing just to give it some interest because you know, a model that has nothing on it is pretty boring so I had to use a little artistic license here to portray it the way it may have looked at that time.
20 minutes later. I like to use a Q-tip here to uh, get rid of the large areas. It just makes a quicker job of everything and cleans up the majority of the wash. Now I go in with a brush just so that I can be a little more precise with the removal process. A little longer than a few minutes later. Because this is an oil wash, you'll have at least 30 minutes, probably longer, to go in and clean up those areas. As opposed to enamel paints, which you have to go in a little sooner because they become more permanent quicker. These Tamiya Paneline paints are an enamel product, so you have to be a little more uh, diligent cleaning them up and getting to them quicker, as they will dry on you and be harder to remove the longer you leave them. They really add a lot of depth to the panel lines, in my opinion. Here I'm adding the black panel line wash and I think it really works well for implying grease or uh, grime. You can see here how it really makes those details pop and come forward. This is a technique I use a lot when I'm figure painting. It really adds a lot of light to the model without getting that really nasty hard edge dry brush feel. I'll use the same light gray or yellow and slowly build these highlights up by multiple layering. If you're not familiar with the term mapping, all it is is adding in lighter or darker patches of random color to give more texture and random areas of wear to your model. I know some of you may be concerned about uh, adding oils and acrylics together and layering over top of each other, but uh, to be honest I've never really had a problem doing this and I think you can get some really cool effects by uh, layering acrylics over the oils and oils over acrylics. Yeah, 
hopefully you didn't have to spatula yourself off the uh, roof after that but you know it had to be done there's a lot of talk about this next term ambient occlusion going on around the modeling circles and uh, basically it's just creating light and shadow and you always want to have light up against a shadowed surface to create that depth. You're creating false shadows and highlights essentially to give your model more of a three-dimensional look. It's used a lot in animation for creating shadows and highlights. If you don't care for using pigments, this step will be a great tool to have in your arsenal of effects. Just thin the paint down to a uh, milky-like consistency and keep blending that paint over and over uh, with a couple different tones layering over top of the surface and you'll end up with a nice dusty looking finish. That's a lot more permanent than straight pigment. As you can see, ambient occlusion or false lighting really helps bring those uh, extruded details forward and really makes the uh, model look a lot more three-dimensional. It's also a great technique for making surfaces look oily or grimy. Spattering is a step that can be easily overdone if you're not careful. So always uh, test the spatters before you put it on the model on a white card or paper, giving you an idea of how big those spatters will actually be before you put it on the model itself. Remember to go back in with a clean brush with some thinner and clean up the areas you don't really care for. I really like the spattering technique. It adds a lot of visual interest. Give it a try on your next model and uh, maybe leave me a comment down below and let me know how it looked on your model.
बाय बाय I really like this product. It gives a nice scale look to the mud. It's not uh, overly heavy or gritty and you can use it for spattering mud texture up onto your vehicle like I'm doing here. I like to apply a little mud along the bottom edge of the turret. You don't want to get too much of the mud spattered up top of there because uh, you know mud's not going to travel that far but it does imply the rain has run down and moved all the dirt to the bottom of the turret. When streaking paint down the vertical sides of your model, this is implying uh, rain that has pulled dirt and grime from the top of the vehicle down the side and that will stain the sides and leave light and dark marks, which again creates a lot of visual interest and depth as well. As you can see with all the layers I've created so far, it's really getting uh, interesting as far as the finish goes. This is the point where things really start coming together in my opinion. And the key here is to be subtle, yet you want these things to stand out. You don't want them to stick out like a sore thumb, but uh, you know you want them to be there and some are going to be stronger than others and that's okay you have to remember when weathering a model that it's all about patience and taking a step back every now and then and really looking at it and analyzing what's going on and noticing if uh, you know your darks are dark enough and your lights are light enough if things are popping or they're you know just blah and boring you always want to try to create as much visual impact as you can. This is the same technique I was using earlier with a very thin glaze of uh, acrylic paint. And you're just building those layers up along the bottom again just to imply dust that has gone over top of the darker mud. It's a very useful and effective technique. One thing I wanted to point out was the grills on this small scale model. You never want to paint things to be just a big black void. That's where things start really looking uh, toy-like to me and unnatural. Uh, add your washes or your 
deep colors in there and then you kind of want to leave the center area of it lighter that sort of implies like there's light going in underneath and creating that three-dimensional look to uh, the inside of the vehicle when you're doing diesel stains on a vehicle they take on a bit of an orange tone when they mix with the dirt and the grease and the oil and the dust so they're going to be a little different than uh, petrol or fuel stain. So you just want to keep this in mind when creating that type of fuel staining. When creating fuel stains, I find by adding pigments to the areas where you're putting those oils or enamels in, the enamels and oils will soak up some of that pigment and give you that uh, authentic looking uh, fuel stain, you know, where you see uh, it kind of creates a a shape around the dirt and uh, leaves that typical fuel type staining. This is a dark brown oil paint I'm using here to create dirty textures that uh, may have come from boots or scuffs while crews are walking on the horizontal surfaces of the vehicle. Don't forget to add a few hydraulic or grease leak stains here and there. You don't want to go wild with this and have them absolutely everywhere, but a few well-placed uh, patches are uh, really effective and again gives the model a little more interest for the viewer to look at. If you feel the model is getting a little too dark, you can always go with some more acrylic and um, pick out some of the details and pop those extruded details out a little more. I was once told as a wee lad not to play with my paint, but you know what, <laughs> I couldn't resist.
Satisfied. When creating rusty textures like a muffler or what have you, it's always good to look at some reference photos and look at natural items and see how they rust. Uh, something like this, you want to look at real vehicles like a caterpillar or a truck, anything like that, heavy equipment, and take some photographs or whatever. And you'll notice and be able to tell exactly how rust looks and is affected by heat. Again with your fuel stains you want to add your dust pigment, earth, earth tones and black smoke pigment and your fuel stain mixture and just keep layering those on top of each other until you create the look you're going after. This is a great way to create random fuel spills and spatters on the back of an engine deck or anywhere where mechanical work is being done. This is a super useful modeling product. If you can get your hands on it, uh, get some. It's not great for a glue, but it works great on making clear lenses or uh, recreating parts that you might have sanded off during your modeling process. Considering how bad these tracks really were, I mean the actual model itself was pretty good for its scale, but uh, the tracks really lacked detail, and I think this technique actually worked out pretty good. And I think it, uh, I was able to pull off a fairly authentic looking muddy track here.
Pencil lead works great to recreate um, uh, bare metal, but I find that uh, rubbing on the pigment actually makes them look even more realistic. I think that's all I have to say for this video. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing. Hit the bell notification below. Give me a thumbs up. And share this video with someone in this great modeling community. You still here? Go, go. Video's over. See ya. I gotta go. Bye.